so good to be here tonight to have you with us in the house of the Lord and the Lord has been good to us uh, don't forget our Sunday morning service this Sunday uh, we'll continue our study in the book of Acts if the Lord will allow me to uh, the week after that Sunday the second Sunday uh, I mentioned this the other day that I know some of you have heard this and you'll probably think I don't want to hear that again I don't want to preach again but it has to be done and uh, I want to minister to people uh, and I want to preach that message on the Lord healing the broken heart and we're going to do it so we can have it videoed because I don't want to write a book yet I don't want to just let somebody watch it on video and then they can take it and I will be uh, amazingly transparent when I do that and I will be uh, really really transparent and I know some of you have heard it, and but be here and bear with me, and let the Lord touch you, and pray that others who will see those DVDs of that will be touched as well. And then the following Sunday, if the Lord lets me, we will do uh, the full one that we did just a little bit of in our second service a couple weeks ago on forgiveness, and, and what it really means to forgive, and the power of forgiveness, and... Uh, if I can forgive some of the things that I've been through, it shouldn't be hard for anybody to forgive. And uh, the Lord has blessed me and helped me with that. That's all pending on if I get the release from the Lord to do that. So that's what I'm planning on. So, amen. But tonight, it's good to be here. Amen. Amen. Back in uh, 98, 1998, when I was 42 years old, uh, when I was 42 years old, man, that was a long time ago. I had a quadruple bypass surgery and uh, on June the 10th in 1998, and uh, the doctors told me then that if I made it to 60, that I would really be doing good, that if I'd lived to be 60. And I remember when I turned 60, uh, we had a party because we knew we had beat the odds. Well, if the Lord lets me make it another four and a half hours, I'll be 65. Amen. <laughs> Tomorrow I'll be sick. I told my wife while ago, I said at supper, I said, I'm going to wake you up. If I wake up at 5 after midnight, I said, I'm going to wake you up and tell you I made it. She said, don't you even think about it. <laughs> but I, I, I won't. Unless I, unless I wake up and I start talking real loud, she, I accidentally wake her up. Would be the, would be the only way. <laughs> Amen. I have been known to do that accidentally <laughs> amen everybody said praise the lord amen amen glad you're here tonight turn with me in your bibles to the book of second corinthians chapter three I've got something on my heart i hope i can say it in a way that uh, you can that you don't leave here going what was he talking about but i hope i can say it in a way that it'll make clarity with say it with clarity and uh, i want to say that i am in love with the Lord. He's been so good to me. Amen. Amen. You know, the Lord uh, just blessed our church the other day. The neighbor come by my house over across the street. He come by my house and he said, you need to go over to the church because he said uh, a truck went under your awning and hit it and tore it up. And uh, uh, and he said he just hit it and got out and looked at it and drove off. And he said, I stood out there. He said, I stood out there and looked at him and pointed my finger at him to let him know that we seen he got some information about it and all of that. And uh, so I came over here and looked. And uh, a long story short, somebody's seen it. And uh, he was a, uh, just happened to be a guttering and softening repair guy. And he stopped his crew by here in just within an hour or so of it happening. And the wind was already starting to blow, and it was blowing soffit off. And uh, he took his, he and his crew got out and fixed it. And uh, you didn't even know it happened. But if you look on this side, over on this side, there's a little kink in that track where that sets. And, and if we fix it, it won't be that big a deal to fix that. But this gentleman came by 
and fix that at no charge to us and just said, hey, I just want to do something for the Lord and uh, stopped by and fixed it and never asked for a thing and drove off. But we sent him a nice little card and let him know how much we appreciated it. And, and when, when I came over here and checked that, the Lord just spoke something into my heart that I want to pass to you and I want you to understand this. When he just spoke to my heart, he said, I have people you know not of. And he said, I will send them as you need them. And you need to get that in your heart and in your life. That the Lord has people that when we are in need, when we're struggling, He will send somebody by to help us. You believe that? I believe that. Amen. And, and uh, so I'm thankful for the goodness of the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you ye are you are our epistle written in our hearts known and read of all men for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us written not with think but with the spirit of the living God not in tables of stone but in fleshly tables of the heart and such trust have we through Christ to Godward, that we are that not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. That last verse says, "Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency." is of God. I want to talk to you just for a few minutes this evening on the subject of the frailty of man. The frailty of man. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. We're living in uh, strange times. Everybody knows this. That's not a news flash. That's not a revelation. That didn't have to come from God. But no matter how old you are or how young you are, you've never lived uh, or seen anything quite like we are living in today. Uh, I was thinking the other day, and Sister Morrison and I was talking, and, and uh, some of the things that you used to just be able to go to town and get, you have trouble getting now. Uh, you, can't buy a, you can't go to a store and buy a canning lid, and they used to just be thick and cheap, and you can't, you can't find them. You can't, you can't find a fruit jar. And if you find them, you better grab them. You can't, and, and if you want a canner, you can't, you can't find a canner. I wanted a canner the other day to, to can some things. Well, it's because I'm retired. i got time to do these things. I wanted to be able to do, do some of this stuff. And, and Lord, I didn't have time to do it before. And, and I, I like food, and I like preserving food. And I wanted some of these things to do this with. And, 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 and I looked, and I looked, and I looked, and I got online, and I looked. I ended up trying to order one all the way from Pennsylvania and thought I had a, just a simple little uh, ten and a half quart canner and I thought surely I can find one there and, and they called me back and or sent me an email and said we're sorry but we're out of stock don't know when we'll be able to get one I, I, I contacted Presto the company that makes those canners and they said it'll be late January before we even think about ever even having any of those things and anything made out of aluminum and I was in a store one time and I bought a few cans of soup and the lady said you better get all of the soup you can get because she said we're just about to get to where we can't get soup and she said, I said, don't you have any sugar? And she said, no, we can't get sugar. And, and all of these things are becoming, becoming hard to find. And, 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 and if you're a, a hunter or, or you like guns, you know that ammunition from time to time gets hard to find. And a lot of things we used to like to get, we just simply can't get. And we always thought that we could handle this and we could do this and we could have things by ourselves. But, but as the scripture says, and as Paul is talking about, he said, we can't do anything by ourselves. Ourselves. Our sufficiency is not of ourselves because there is a limitation there. There's a limitation, but there's no limitation to God because he said our sufficiency is not of ourselves, but our sufficiency of God. And, and let's look at a situation here that Paul is in. Paul is uh, this missionary and he's starting these churches and he's doing some tremendously great things and he started this church in Corinth. What a 
and, and, and I say this in the nicest, politest way, in all due respect to Paul and everything else, but what a crazy church Corinth was. If you've ever just read the letters and not just picked a verse out here to pick the verse out there, but would you try to put both of those letters in context, it, it was a crazy church. He started out as a missions church, but history tells us it got up to something like some 10,000 people. It was like an early mega church. And, and when you have 10,000 people, I don't care if you baptize them all in Jesus' name every Sunday and they all pray through every Sunday, people are going to be people. And they didn't have scripture to go by. You know, now when we get ready, for example, here's just a couple things that Paul was dealing with in that church. One of the things was he was dealing with uh, the Lord's Supper. He was instituting communion. And they didn't have anything to set in stone where they could go back and say, now this is, this is what the Lord said. And they were bringing them in by the thousands and having a big old feast and, and having a big old meal like a Thanksgiving dinner and calling it the Lord's Supper or communion. And Paul was said, whoa, don't do that. Don't do that. They were having uh, the gifts of the Spirit. We know how they're supposed to operate. We know that as Paul, because Paul had to set it straight in the church of Corinth. He set all the gifts of Spirit in order. He said, this is how they operate. This is how they move. He said, if you have tongues interpretation, he said, you do it no more than by two or three at a time. And he said, then, you know, and he explained all of that. And he, he talked about prophecies and he talked about all of those type of things. And, and they just, it just got, just got sillier and sillier. They had, uh, they had problems with morality issues and they had all kinds of godliness issues and separation issues and, and, and Paul had to set it straight and he had to get it and now it seems like in this passage of scripture in his second letter to them he has to make an apology for, for seeming to commend himself when he began to talk about himself now there's, there's so much opposition to him that he He's not trying to commend himself, but it's interpreted that he's trying to commend himself. And so now he seems to have to apologize to that. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? In other words, he said, do you know who I am? He said, do I need to have others bring me a letter of reference and give it to you? Or do I need to get one from you and take it to them? Because there were people who were coming and saying, Paul is this and Paul is that and, and, and Paul is whacked and Paul's going off the court and Paul does all. And you can imagine what, what they were saying about Paul. And he makes an apology for, for needing to commend himself. And, and, and he thought it was a convenient thing really to... to to protest his, his, uh, his sincerity to them because there were some at Corinth who wanted to blast his reputation. Don't think it strange when somebody, when you try to start living for God and you start doing good and, and you start to feel good about what God is doing in your life, that somebody don't come along and try to smack you. And just try to convince you that, that you are not everything that you're claiming to be. If they'll do that to the Apostle Paul, they'll do that to me and you. You don't know how many times in my life I've heard this phrase. I thought you was a preacher. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I thought you were a Christian. I thought you claimed to be. Whoa, that's not a year. Now, you better be careful. Your preacher will find out. You just better be careful because that church finds out. Yeah, I thought you was going to church now, you know. And, and, and you're doing your best and you're giving it everything you got. And, and Paul feels like that they're attacking him and they're beginning to, there's people that are blasting him. And he says, do I need to get a letter from somebody else to prove to you again who I am? Or do I need to take something from you to try to establish to them who I, who I really am? Am and, and everything that is going on, but he was not desirous of any vain. Excuse me, he was not desirous of a what we would call a vain glory, an empty glory. But and he tells them that, and and that he neither needed nor desired any verbal commendation from them. He said, "I don't need letters of testimony from them," because he said there were some who did, and and, and they were the ones that he called. He considered them a false prophet because they were always having to have somebody else hold them up. 
They always had to have somebody else's to affirm them. Let me just pause right here to say, that's one of the frail things about humanity is so often we need somebody to affirm us. And there has to come a point in your walk with God, and especially in the day and time we're living in, that it's nice to have people say good things about you, but if nobody says anything good about you, you still need to know who you are in Christ. We don't have a parking place out there where we save it for saint of the month. <laughs> I knew a pastor friend one time. He, he didn't have very many people in his church. He had time to do this. I don't have time to do this. I'll be honest with you. I got too many things I have to do to, <laughs> to, to do this. But he kept a file on everybody. A file. The Manila file. I don't do this. This is stupid. I'm sorry, but this is, just, this is just not what I'm doing. You don't have to worry about that. And then he would go to his office after every service, and he would evaluate everybody. Well, the whites were here. They sat on the front row, and they seemed tired like they'd work today. What's their deal? What's their deal? You know, they, did, they worshiped on a scale of 1 to 10. They worshiped at a 4, you know? And... They gave in the offering, but they, you know, they left early or whatever. I, I'm just, you know, and then there's Brother Rich. He played the drums. He seemed like he was feeling better today. Who's got time for that? And then do we award a parking place or a, a gold star or a special banner that we wear as member of the month? Or, or what, what, what do we do with that? Paul, Paul was saying, I don't need that from you because I know who I am in God. I don't need it from them, and I don't need it from you. I just need to know who I am in my own heart. I need to know that. And I understand, and I'm an encourager, and I love to encourage people, and I love, love to build people up because Paul taught us that everything we do in church he said, let it be done to the edification. And we should strive to edify, to lift up. And that's good. But there comes a point in our lives when there's nobody there to tell you how godly you are and how precious you are, and how important you are, and how much you mean to them. There just comes a point in your life when it seems like everything around you begins to swirl, and it begins to swirl and swirl, and you feel like you begin to listen to what they say, and you begin to listen to how they react, and you sometimes question in your own mind, am I really what I thought I was in God? And you've got to get past that and in the day and age we're living in you've got to be able to affirm in your own mind no we're not perfect and don't let it become a, a point of contention in your life where nobody can tell you anything you got to be smart enough to understand that when the pastor preach or the preacher preaches and they're doing those things they're not doing them uh, to be mean and to be to be browbeating and to trying to destroy us. We're trying to help to get us to where we ought to be. But, but on the other hand, we can't take that and say, I don't need that because I know who I am in God. No, we always have room for improvement. What I'm talking about are the people who are trying to destroy you. I'm not talking about the people that are trying to help you. I'm not talking about the pastor in the church that's trying to help you. I'm talking about those people who never thought you'd live for God anyway. And so now that you are or they're going to try their best to see that you don't. Somebody said, praise the Lord. Amen. They wanted to blast his reputation. You know, a reputation is something that is, that is hard to get and easy to lose. You don't have to... You know, you can, you can be accused of something and prove that you're innocent... And everybody will say, that's because he had a good lawyer. You know, they proved that it happened here, but you was in Oklahoma City while that happened. It's because you had a good lawyer. And there will always, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, and there will always be that cloud of doubt. No, oh, you know what I'm talking about, how things can happen. And they blast your reputation because even if they say they're sorry, that there's always going to be that element that's going to wonder. 
He didn't want any vainglory. He said, I don't want any vainglory. You know who I am. And he tells them that he, he wasn't in, in need of this verbal communication or con, uh, uh, a commendation of them. And he said, I don't need a letter of recommendation. He said, others do. But his ministry was among them, and it had been without controversy. It had been without controversy. It had been a great ministry. It had, it had been an honorable ministry. It established what a powerful work. And, and uh, regardless of how little physically he was, because when you look at the life of Paul, Paul was, Paul was not something that, that, was, that you would put on the picture of a magazine to be attractive, but Paul... Paul was not a picture of a, somebody that you would put on the cover of a, of a billboard and say, look who's preaching for us tonight. If Paul was preaching, you just wouldn't put his picture out there. You'd just, you'd just say, Paul's going to be here. You're all going to get healed, but we're not going to put his picture up there. He's going to cast out 150 devils out of our town, but, but we're not putting his picture up there because Paul was, was kind of a rough looking, and he, he, a lot of things said about him, but, but no matter how little his person was in reality or how contemptible some would, would have him thought to be because Paul Paul was not a very uh, you know John, John was the one who who was the uh, gentle persuader and he was the one who had his head on on the lap of or on the heart of Jesus and it was John the beloved and, and John was the one that they put in charge to oversee the administrator Paul was the one that just come in and said that ain't right Paul's the one that just, he just look at you and cast the devil out. He's, you know, Paul was the one, he was straightforward. He was, he had that personality. Peter was just was rambunctious, but Paul was poor, more matter of fact. He was scholarly, but he was matter of fact. And the Corinthians themselves were his real commendation. And a good testimony for him is what they were. And that God was with him was, was the truth and that he was sin of God and he said he told them he said you are my epistles you are my epistles and that was the testimony that he delighted in and that that was what was most dear to him they were written in his heart he said he said just look at what I've done and how you reacted and and he said, look, look what's done. He said, he said God has written you not, not, with, not with stone, but, but it's like Ezekiel talked about, but it, it, was, it was like he, he took it and wrote the, the law of God in their heart. Amen. There's nothing more delightful to, and I'll just put this in as a note, there's nothing more delightful to a pastor than, and, and our greatest commendation is when people start living for God and you begin to see their success and you begin to see people grow and recover and heal and you begin to see people's lives begin to blossom and become what they want and you begin to see them take them from way down there where they were and you begin to see them as, as they grow. That's all the commendation that Paul was saying I needed and the, the apostle was careful to, to not assume too much for himself. Now stay with me, I'm, I'm getting there. Paul was careful not to assume too much to himself, but to give all the praise to God. You see, if we have anything in life, now that's a background, that's a background where we are. This is what was going on in the life of Paul. He was trying to reestablish and try to assure them, I don't need an accommodation. He said, you're my accommodation. You're, you're all, you, you, you know, I don't need a plaque, you're my plaque. I don't need a letter of appreciation, you're my letter of appreciation. And what Paul was saying was, he was not taking anything for himself. And we need to understand this tonight. When I began to study this, I, I just felt like the, like the Lord was not in a, in a, in a rebuking manner and all. And, and he wasn't like, you need to tell the people, they need me. But, but I just felt like the Lord wanted us to understand that we do not need to assume too much to ourselves, but we need to learn to give all of the praise and the glory to God. Because we can't even keep enough toilet paper in the stores. We can't even, we can't even keep canning lids in the store. We can't, we can't do anything by ourselves. 
And Paul was saying, if there is anything that is going on here in this church that's good, he said, it's not because of me. He said, he said but it's, it's, it's by the Spirit of God. That's what Paul was saying. Paul was saying, it's not me that have done anything. And we need to look, we need to look at ourselves. And, and he was saying that, that they were the epistle of Christ. The, the apostle and the others were but instruments, and Christ was the author. He said, he's the author and the finisher of our salvation. And everything that is good, that was is within us. Because see, when we come to God, and I say this in all sincerity today, when we come to God, there's a lot of things in our life that's not real good. When I came to God, there was a lot of stuff in my life that wasn't real good. My morals wasn't good. My language wasn't good. My work ethic wasn't I didn't have a whole lot going for me when I came to God. But when I came to God and he began to write that epistle, Paul said we are an epistle written by God. When God began to write my life, when God began to do those things, it wasn't me that did those things because if I had been able to do it, I wouldn't have needed him to written the epistle. I wouldn't have needed that at all. But I need to be aware of my frailty that I can't do this without God and Satan wants to come along and make us feel like now look what we have become look what we have become man you're, you're a Christian you've got it going on you've, you've got this separation concept you know what it's like to let the thief steal no more and the liar lie no more and you've got these morals going on man you, you, you've got this all going straight look, look what you, you've really done good for yourself and what happens is Satan attacks us with that and we begin to almost in a sense we begin to almost puff ourselves up Amen. The epistle wasn't written in ink, but it was written by the Spirit of the living God. Nor wasn't written in tablets. It wasn't written as the law of God was given to Moses. It was written in our lives and our heart. But the adversary of our soul wants to come along and make us think it's us. It's us. It's us. And, and I just want to be real honest with you folks. If there's any good thing in us, it ain't us. If there's any virtue in us, it ain't us. If there's any integrity in us, if there's any godliness in us, if there's any righteousness in us, it ain't us. Because Paul said it when he said, my sufficiency is not of myself. You know what he was talking about there? He wasn't saying, I, my ability to get a fruit jar lid is not of myself. That's not what he was saying. He said, my ability to think right. You know what Paul talks about? Paul talks about several things as a theme through his life, his writing. But one of the things he talks about is the ability to think right. He talks about our mind being transformed. He talks about our mind being renewed. Okay, let me just talk about that one thing for just a minute. When we're a child, we, we, a child has a thing called an innocence. Amen. Your little granddaughter, Sister Carter, when she's here, she'll, she'll come up to you and she'll look at me and she'll kind of, with that little squint that she does, and she'll sing, you are my sunshine. That's called innocence. That's called innocence. But then as we mature, I used to be innocent and you used to be innocent. But as we mature and we become aware of life and sin begins to come into our life and it robs us of that innocence and then we no longer think like we used to think. There's times that I used to, uh, and I just use myself as an example. When I first got the Holy Ghost, and, and I was 19 years old when I came back to the Lord, and that was in seven, September of 74, when I came back to the Lord, and, and I acknowledged my call to preach to my pastor on, on January 1st, 76, and, and when I first started preaching in 78, I was just like a kid singing, You Are My Sunshine. I was so innocent. I thought everything and everybody was perfect, and, and I didn't have a clue what I was in for. But after 40 years, or longer now, 
I've been licensed with the United Pentecostal Church for over 40 years now. And, 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 and so uh, about 42 years since I've been preaching. And, and I, when, I, when all of that happens, I've seen so much stuff that you know what it's hard for me to do? It's hard for me to maintain my innocency in my, in my thoughts and in my life as far. Not that, not, that I'm, not that I'm doing anything wrong, but it's just that I've seen enough. Well, haven't you seen some things in your life that's changed since you was five years old? That you look at life different than you did when you went to school the first day and your name was on the desk and you was all wide-eyed? No. Ah. By the time you graduated high school, you had seen enough stuff. You weren't like you was in first grade. And, and, and you know what? Sometimes I'll be honest with you. I pray and I say, Lord, please let me go back to those days of the, that, that innocence to where in my ministry where, where it was all pure and clean and I hadn't, hadn't had any rejection and I hadn't had anybody tell me off and I hadn't had anybody tell me they didn't like me and I hadn't had anybody abuse me or my family or do anything. And, and let's let me go back to that and, and let me understand something and then I come to the place where like Paul was and I realize that none of it is within me anyway. It's all him if there's anything that's good. Amen. He claims he disclaims, excuse me, the taking of any praise to himself and he gives all the glory to God. Because you see, if, if you give the glory to God then that takes the that takes the brunt of anything that comes against us away. If I go to work for Brother White and he's baking cakes and I'm delivering cakes and he's making the cakes and I'm delivering the cakes and I take a cake to Sister McKnight and I say, here's the cake and she starts in on me, it's like, hey, I just brought it. I didn't bake the cake. I'm just a delivery guy. Hey, man. Hey, when you live for God and you understand something, the only thing that you are is what God has made you, and if somebody doesn't like that, it ain't on you, honey. It's on God. Deal with God on it. You don't like the way I am. Talk to God about it. Let God, yeah, 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 yeah. Because you know why? Because my sufficiency, as Paul said, my sufficiency is not of myself. It's not of me. I can't do it by myself. And Paul said, I don't need letters of accommodation. He said, you know who I am. You know what I am, regardless of what they say. You know everything that's going on. And he said, because my sufficiency is not of myself. But he said, my sufficiency is of God. We're not sufficient of ourselves. We can never have made such a good impression on our hearts or upon our own if it, if it hadn't been for God. You see, such are our weaknesses and our inabilities that we cannot of ourselves even think a good thought. We can't even think a pure thought. Because that's why Paul said our minds have to be renewed. Okay, I'm, I'm just about done. But I, I want you to just, I don't want you to go too far back and think too many things. But somebody ought to say, man, we think different after we live for God than what we used to think. When you get full of the Holy Ghost and you start living for God, your thinking process begins to change. And it's just, not, it's just not that somebody hands you a set of rules and says, now here's the book of rules. Now here, now you're a Christian. Here's the owner's manual. Now the first half are the things you can do. It's, it's really not the half. It's only the first 15 pages. But the other 400 pages are all the things you can't do. No, nobody hands you a manual and says this is what you can do and what you can't. You know what it is? It's the Word of God, the Spirit of God, as He begins to write His law upon your heart. And as He begins to write the law in His heart, and He begins to put that Word inside your heart, how does it affect you? It doesn't affect you like, like you say, well, I want to, but I can't. You know what it does? He goes on and He says, it gets it in your heart and it changes your thinking process to where you don't even want to do that anymore. 
I mean, this is not this is not in depth, deep stuff. This is pretty simple, because we can't even think a thought the way God wants us to. Our weaknesses and our ability that we we cannot even uh, think a good thought, little alone raise any good thoughts or affections in other men towards us. All of our sufficiency is of God. To Him, therefore, are owing all the praise and the glory of that which is good is done in us. And, and if all of the good that is done in us comes from Him, then we have to give Him the praise and the honor for who we are. Because in Him we receive our grace and our strength to where we can do more. Amen. This is true considering, concerning the preachers and it's also concerning all people that are trying to live for God. The best are no more than what the grace of God makes them. The best in us is what the grace of God has made us. I don't want there to be a switch that we can flip. I can walk over here and I'll do it now so we won't have to do it later. But there's a big switch over here and I'll hit this switch and those fans will just begin to die down. I don't want there to be a switch that flips and we all go back to like we used to be. But what we are, we are, we are people who are trying our best to live for God. And His grace is developing good things in our life. Amen. Amen. Our hands are not sufficient for us. But our sufficiency is in of God. And His grace is sufficient for us to furnish us with everything we need for every good work. And you know, Paul said, I don't need, or he asked him, he said, should I get letters from you to take to them? Do I need letters from them to take to you? He said, he said what do I need? He said, but I don't need any of that. He said, because he said, I want you to know this. And he said, you know me. And you know that my sufficiency, I'm not living like I'm living because I'm just a naturally a good person. I'll tell you something I've said before, and, and, and I don't even want to say it again in, in the way that I've said it before because it, it, it shows a side that I just soon not ever let, let be shown. But, but I've said things like this. I've said things like, those are some folks that need to really be glad I've got the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yeah. And those folks need to really pray for me that I stay full of the Holy Ghost. Because if ever I'm not, Can anybody understand that? Do you know why we don't go do the stupid stuff that wants to come into our mind? It's because the grace of God is working good in our life. The reason we don't say things that we used to would have said is because the grace of God is working in our life. The way we don't react like we used to react. And then even when, even, even when people question us about our sincerity and our realness, or our burden, or our godliness, or our prayer life, or whatever it is. They question you, and it wants to bring you down a little bit. You just have to understand that, 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 that the grace of God is still working in my life to work good things. God is still working for good things in my life. I thought today, I thought, Lord, sometimes we think of pastoral messages of, of rebuking and straightening things out. I'd hate to think that the only time I ever heard from the Lord was just when I needed a whipping. I'd hate to think that 
The only time my children ever saw me was when I was getting ready to grab them up by the shirt collar and give them what my dad used to call on a rare occasion, switch tea. <laughs> Didn't have to have much switch tea. We had a wild cherry tree, and he'd say, I'll give you some switch tea. And you could hear them little leaves coming off of those beads. You know, he just had to just do that. He didn't have to do it. He just he did it a time or two enough to let me know that he would do it. But I didn't want to think. But that's the only interaction I had with my dad. When my dad would say, hey, son, come here. I want to talk to you. And I'm like, oh, boy. And I just tighten up because I know I'm getting a whooping. I wanted, I wanted to have some sit-down time with my dad and have some fellowship time because I wanted to go to him in trouble. And when I would get in trouble, I wanted to be able to go to him and, and know that he could help me take care. And so I just wanted to share this with you tonight. And, and I, I don't even know why, but I just, felt that, I just felt the Lord pulling me to this. And I just felt like that the Lord wanted me to say this is a pastoral type of thing, not, not a correction, but just a reassuring from the Father. Just a reassuring from the Father. That even though there's times you feel under attack, and it makes you wonder, what, what's the point? Could you imagine Paul got flustered? He had started that church from nothing, and now it's one of the biggest churches, and they're wanting him to prove himself? That would be like Sam Walton have to come in and try to prove he knew how to run a store. You know? I mean, like, <laughs> really? You know, you got you to... And sometimes we feel that way. We feel like we've given our lives to God, and now all of a sudden we've got to try to prove it again. And the Lord is just telling you this tonight. I want you to understand this. This is what the Lord is telling you from your pastor's heart tonight, is that His grace is still working and you may stumble and you may fall and you may say things or you may react wrong or you may do things that you wish you could pull it back but words and actions are like like water poured on the ground once they're there you don't get them back but the Lord is saying hey I've still my grace is sufficient and when Paul said my sufficiency is not of myself. I don't have the ability in myself to do good, but His grace works in my life. I'm closing. Would you stand?